The NFL draft is right around the corner and it looks like the Indianapolis Colts are all set to draft Andrew Luck, but maybe they want to think about that a little bit more. Here to weigh in is Cade Massey. He's a Wharton professor who's done exhaustive research into the value of their, those first round draft picks. So Cade, talk to us a lot about the Colts situation. They're desperate for a quarterback. They don't have Manning anymore and Andrew Luck is considered a sure thing. So they should go all in here and, and get gra grab them, right? Well, I think if the NFL draft has taught us anything in history is that there's no such thing as a sure thing. And we've always felt that the first pick in the draft is the most valuable pick, but only if you trade it away. So these guys are, um, they've put themselves in this situation by trading Wayne Payton. So it's a little bit different at this point. But in general, we recommend getting out of that pick. Take, fewer, take more players later in the draft at lower cost. So that flies in the face of conventional wisdom because the Colts did have that number one pick in 1998 and uh, at least according to your research they should have passed on Peyton Manning at that point and traded that pick for more picks. The quarterback position might be the hardest position to play in all of sports. So do you think that the downside of missing out on a franchise guy outweighs any risk of having a bust? Well, you gave you gave a good example with Manning in '98, but there have been many, many examples of picks taken at the top of the draft, quarterbacks taken at the top of the draft that didn't turn out so well. So obviously, right after Peyton, number two, Ryan Leaf, one of the biggest busts in NFL history, and there was great debate in '98 over which of those two guys was going to be best. Mm. We can go through the list from them, and there's there's just more risk there than people think. You see these guys, and they they seem fantastic, and there's just a limit to how much we can know. There's a limit to how much we can project how a college player is going to be in the pros. Now, we looked at the numbers. It looks like there were 37 pro bowlers uh, drafted in the first round uh, in the last five years versus 30 for all of the other rounds. It seems like the elite players are in that first round. Why do you say that there's more value in those later rounds? Well, if we didn't have any salary cap, uh, that'd be fine. But we're... In a salary cap world, you're not interested just in Pro Bowls, but in Pro Bowls per dollar. They've got to figure out how to spend money wisely because they can only spend so much of it. Um, also, Pro Bowls are rare. As much as we like to have them, as much as they're the sexy stat, mm. um, they're exceedingly rare. And so we work more often with starts. We, we try to evaluate the draft in, in many ways, but the, the statistic that we find most um, representative is starts. And uh, starts are much more evenly distributed over draft picks in the rounds. They're not as uniquely associated with the first round as Pro Bowls are. But the starts may not actually be associated with the quality of the player. I guess the guy that comes to mind for me is, is Aaron Rodgers, right? So how do you account for, for factors that may not be in the player's own control? Right, so it's, I mean, obviously it's tough and it's imperfect. And so the main thing we do is look at things from a lot of different angles. And no matter what angle we've taken on this question, Michelle, mm -hmm. it always comes back the same, that the, that the top of the draft is not worth the price you have to pay. It's, it's just exceedingly expensive to take those guys, and there's no sure thing. And so it ends up being bad value. Now, we do know, though, that uh, the CBA, the new CBA, definitely accounted for uh, the rookies getting less money. You know, Cam Newton clearly gets much less uh, than Sam Bradford, and he's going to impact that team's cap uh, much less than Sam Bradford does. So how does that new CBA and that new salary structure affect your research? Right. It was a, it was a great, it was a great um, question for us. We were very interested in seeing what they did, obviously. And kind of surprised that it didn't get moved around as much as you would think. So the big changes happened at the very top, and it's not the top 15, it's not really even the top 10, the top three, four, five players look different now than they used to. The rest, strikingly similar. And so there's still this very steep relation. The main issue here is that the steep relation between when a guy gets drafted, especially in the first round, when a guy gets drafted and how much he's paid, that is just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't relate to how he actually performs. It's much steeper in compensation than it is in actual performance. So, so, so right. Well, I was going to say, what do you make of the Redskins trading up and paying that steep price uh, to get RG3? You know, we're, I, have, I have preached for years the wisdom of trading down. And so when I see a team do that, I, I, it doesn't strike me as, as a smart move. I mean, um, 
they gave away, I mean, the first round picks were so valuable, especially if you trade them, and they gave away three years of first round picks and a second round pick, which is also a huge value. They're, they're not only betting that RG3, who's probably going to be a great player, phenomenal college player, they're not only betting that he's going to be an all pro, a regular all pro player, but that he can do that with three or four fewer key players around him because they're putting all of their chips on the quarterback position. They're not going to be able to support him as well because of having given away these other picks. Now, RG3 is going to be a tremendously popular player, obviously, uh, since he won the Heisman, and Andrew Luck will as well, arguably, in, in uh, Colts Nation. Does the off-the-field uh, stuff factor in? Um, does it at, le at least mitigate the risk, for instance, that jersey sales, increased sponsorship, increased ticket sales, mitigate the risk of spending that amount of money on the, that elite player? You know, it, it's probably it, it probably does some for the quarterbacks. Um, we we've, we've looked at it, and you know, teams don't always draft quarterbacks number one. Teams sometimes take offensive linemen number one, and so it, it can't be the case that that's always why they're willing to do that because there's no offensive tackle out there who's made a difference in jersey sales. But the main thing is that we're talking about winning the audience and winning the fans in April versus winning the fans in November and December, and. Talk to teams like Bill Belichick about how what he cares about. Does he care about fan approval in April? Or does he care about how fans feel in November? Talk to the Patriots fans themselves. They've, I think, come to learn that you don't worry too much about who's drafted. Mm. And what you care about is how your team's doing in the playoffs late in the year. Of course, uh, the Patriots famous for their acumen in the draft and, of course, drafting Tom Brady in the sixth round. So, Cade, we'll have to bring you back in five years to evaluate luck. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Cade Massey, again, he's a Warden professor. I'm Michelle Steele. Thanks for watching and enjoy the NFL draft.